Uh, we're going to get started with that um, code lab. That's step number three in this um, um, this link that I sent. So this is part of the Android Basics with a Compose course. Um, so if you haven't done it at all and this is your first one, I think you'll be able to follow along and it'll be totally fine and great. Um, but I do recommend going back and looking through those other Android Basics with Compose um, courses. So this is part of the second uh, unit, unit two of this course. So the first one is going to teach you a little bit about um, Kotlin as a language. Um, I know Nancy said that she's done IntelliJ in Java. And so that will just give you a little bit of information about like the syntax of Kotlin and things you need to know about it. Uh, one of the big features of Jetpack Compose is that um, it's all written in Kotlin. So we only have to use this one language so we can throw out all of that XML, um, all those XML pain points. Um, and so you can do that. You can learn a little bit about Android Studio um, and some of the features it has uh, as well in that first pathway um, and then just setting up your first project. And then we're going to move on to some of the more advanced topics um, and dive a little bit deeper into Compose. And so we talked about layouts last time and today we're going to do state. So we're going to get started with that intro to state in Compose, um, which is going to be building this tip calculator. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to start a new project in Android Studio for us to work from. So starting my new, new project, uh, Empty Compose, and I am going to name it whatever they named it, which I think was Tip Time. Um, tip Time. Tip. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and finish that. And so now we are just getting our basic Android Studio project set up. Um, letting all of our dependencies sync up. We can go ahead and build and refresh our preview that we talked about last time so that we can see what we're building. Which is a teeny tiny, hello Android. Um, and that's just all the default um, from Android Studio. To get ourselves set up to build this particular project, um, we are gonna open up our strings file we talked about strings last time, and then inside that um, Android, that code lab, there are going to be a couple strings there that we're just going to pull in. So we're going to pull in a string called calculate tip. That's the string calculate tip. Cost of service with the value cost of service and tip amount, which is tip amount. This is actually a formatted string. So we have tip amount and this percentage S. Um, which just means that we can replace that percentage S with a different string when it comes time to use that. So this is just setting us up to get ready to actually write Compose. So we can jump back into our main activity. And so far, everything is just the defaults from an empty um, Compose activity from that template that Android Studio has provided for us. And so by default, it has this greeting function that we talked about last time that displays just a text for hello, um, hello name. And we have a default preview. That's what's going to be showing over here is whatever is using this app preview annotation. And then our actual main activity. And this is what would run um, the code that's actually going to run when we actually run our application. If you were here last time, you saw me forget to update it and be really confused um, when it came to why my app wasn't working. Uh, so to get started, we don't need any of this default stuff. We're throwing it all out. Um, so the first thing I'm just going to do is delete that greeting function. So I get a couple of red ears um, because that function doesn't exist. So we're going to go ahead and get rid of all of those and get started by writing our first composable of the evening, which is going to be um, at composable because all of our composable functions are going to be annotated with a special at composable annotation that just tells Android, the operating system, our framework that this is a UI function and not a regular function. Um, use our fun keyword and call it um, tip time screen. Um, put some parentheses there for, our, and then um, our curly braces for a bracket. And we can add that back so that we don't forget later, um, both tip time and our main application. So it will run and also down here in our preview so that whenever we're we're ready. There's nothing in it yet um, that will be available. So now when I rebuilt that, I have a completely empty preview because there's nothing inside of tip time yet. 
Um, okay, so uh, what we're gonna do is build a little tip calculator. And so it's going to have a title at the top of the screen, um, somewhere to input the amount of uh, the amount of your bill, and then also display the total um, below that. And so we know from last time that we have these um, three different building blocks that we can use to lay out our screen. And those are box that lets us lay out things relative to each other, um, column that's going to let us lay out things um, that flow vertically down our screen. I always have to think really hard about the word vertical and horizontal. Um, so column that lets us flow vertically down the screen and horizontal and row that lets us lay out things horizontally across our screen. And so just from what I described, it's also um, in our in the getting started part of this uh, code lab. We know that our our uh, different UI elements are going right below each other. And so it makes sense for us to use a column here. We'll get started with a column. <clears throat> And then we're going to make a couple of ah, couple modifications um, with saying the word modifier purposely. So we're going to pass in our modifier. And our modifier is going to let us add um, important, add, decorate, add behavior, decorate, customize, or composable. Um, and so we can do our modifier dot. We'll add some padding to all sides, 32.dp, where dp is our um, density independent pixels. And so that's just going to let our this pat, this amount of padding scale for any different Android screen um, that are out there because there are a lot of different Android devices that will have different number of pixels per unit of area. And so this 32 is going to take this density independent and, and scale that depending on however many pixels are on your individual Android device. And so this padding will add 32 to all sides. And then we're also going to add a vertical arrangement. And that will be arrangement dot space by, in our case, we're going to do 8.dp here. And so that's just going to add 8dp of padding in between each element that goes inside this column automatically. Um, awesome. So I think we had a frozen screen problem, but it has been solved. Thank you for jumping in for me there. Um, while I've been doing this, I've been kind of auto importing as I go. Um, but if you ever have a problem where you need to import something, you can always right click and show context actions. And one of those will be importing. It's also, um, I think, option enter on a Mac and um, alt enter on a on a uh, Windows. Um, but as we kind of pull those things in, we had to add a couple of things up here. So we see that modifier was imported, uh, or modifier was probably already there. Um, the padding was imported. Oh, padding was important while we were doing that. Um, arrangement was imported. So um, those things were just kind of happening um, as we go along. Um, but those those imports, if you are having trouble, are in the code lab. Um, so you can just copy and paste those in if you have any problems with those. So the first thing that we want to do is go ahead and add the title to our screen. And so that is just going to be a text. So we're going to call the text composable. So this is also a composable function, um, just like we're building a, fun a composable function that emits UI for our screen. This is one of the core composables that are part of Jetpack Compose that are provided to us um, by using this framework. So we don't have to build this out. It's just ready and available and there, much like the text view. So if I import that te ah, text. Um, I do have one required argument for my text, um, which is the text that it's going to display. Um, but there are a lot of other uh, arguments that I can pass in. So if we jump into um, the text, there's all sorts of things that I can pass in. But only one, I am um, clicked into the annotated string, but um, there's also, this is the one we're actually using. Um, there's only one required argument there that we need to pass in. I'm going to close that so I don't. And so in our case, we already added those strings to our um, string resources. So we can just use string resource and then pass in the ID, which will be r.string.calculate tip. And then um, this app, we're going to make a little prettier than the last app that we built. And so we're going to add a font size. 
and that's going to be 24.sp. Ah, not at. Wow, my typing is not on point today. Um, 24.sp. We'll have to uh, import that. Um, so again, option, option, enter, right clicking. Um, SP differs from DP in that it is a scalable pixel. And so that just allows these texts to scale if someone changes or updates their accessibility settings. Inside your settings, you can set a different font size other than the default. And so anything with that SP as a unit of measurement is going to scale when that changes versus DP, which is which will not, which makes a lot of sense if we think about it. Um, if, we, if you change the font size, you don't want to change all the spacing in between fonts and give your users a ton of white space. We just want to make that text bigger and easier to read and consume. Um, much like the column, we can also update the modifier on the text itself, the text composable. And again, most composables will have that modifier as an argument so that you can customize it to whatever your needs are. So in our case, we're just going to add an alignment here. So we're going to align that and we can use alignment and pull in the one from compose um, and set that to uh, center. Yeah. Center horizontally. So now we actually have something to show in our column. So if we build and refresh, um, I can. I'm going to close my project view over here so that we can see a little bit more of what's there. We can see the calculate tip. So we're good to go. We're making progress on our tip calculator. Um, so the next thing that we want to do is actually add an input for our users. Um, just to make our app look a little bit nicer, we're going to first use um, the spacer. So we see the spacer pop up. and uh, we want to add a modifier there, and we want to use a different ins uh, instance of the modifier. Um, and so we want to set that height to 16, just to add some extra space between um, the, the title of our screen and um, this the input part. So now we have our spacer. So we're going to create a new function for our tip for the um, edit field, the edit text that we're going to put in here for our users to input their uh, their bill amount. And this is one of the features of Compose is that we can create these small reusable components that we can use in multiple places. And so we want to break up our, our big composable, our whole screen, into smaller pieces of, of, uh, our, of our UI. So it's just easier to read, easier to maintain, and again, give us that reusability of those different functions if we need it. Um, so we'll again add that composable annotation, uh, add the function because all of our composables are functions. And this time we're going to name it um, edit number field here. We'll add um, our parentheses for a function. Uh, right now we'll have any arguments um, and our body. And again, just like the text, we're going to pull in one of those core components that are available to us from the Compose uh, core library. And so for a user input, we can use a text field. So um, here we have this text field where it takes in a value and an on value change. And then again, has a bunch of different, um, a different uh, ways that we can add, um, customize that uh, text field. So we'll start with that. And then the two required arguments again, auto populate. So we have value and on value changed. I'm going to take a quick second to review the chat. I had a few problems with Android Studio since Dolphin is basically no app could run. Um, Dolphin is not currently the stable version. So um, it could potentially have problems. Um, right now, we're still on the stable version being Chipmunk, and that is what I am currently running. Um, did it turn stable? That could be true. <laughs> I haven't updated. Um, but I'm running on Chipmunk still. Uh, I thought Dolphin was still in uh, beta. Um, OK, <laughs> see you all are up to date. Um, I'm running on Chipmunk. Um, but I have had known, uh, I have 
heard folks run into different problems with different things um, and definitely just recommend uh, updating whenever they push out those updates. And thank you, thank you for letting me know. It's time to update on my Android Studios then. Uh, so we will um, keep, keep plowing through. So we have these two parameters. We have both the value and um, the on value change for text field. So on value is gonna be whatever is displayed in, uh, in our um, text field. So just the default value or, so it will be the default values, whatever you set it to, but also whatever value, um, whatever it's set to or update it to, that will be the, the text displayed inside that text field. And on value change is going to be a Lambda callback. So it is in Kotlin, um, functions are first class citizens. You can pass them around, you have all these callbacks. And so for that, um, this is gonna be the function that gets triggered whenever a user starts entering text into that text box. So as your users type into that text box, each time it changes, this on value change callback will be triggered. Um, so composable functions um, can follow actually camel case conventions. So they actually can follow either one. Um, they will follow a Pascal case when they are a UI element that doesn't return anything. And so everything that we've written so far is a UI element. Um, these functions should be named like the object that they are. So something like tip time screen, it is an object that describes the UI element. It's representing um, much like edit, uh, edit number field. Later on, we'll see a composable function remember, which is a lowercase r um, because it is not the UI element. So you do actually have a mixture, but most of the ones that we do, most of the ones that we'll be using, and anytime you're really talking about UI um, composable functions, those will be the Pascal case um, naming convention um, to set, separate them apart. And these don't have return types because they emit, they emit your UI and don't return them. And so that's really the distinction there. And some of the earlier Compose uh, code labs do go a little bit more in depth and like into the naming conventions and what you can expect um, for uh, what you should expect and how to name your own composable functions to follow the, the right composable conventions. Okay, so we have set up this edit text and so far we still have these two red lines. Um, so we can give those some default values here with a, uh, just an empty string and an empty Lambda function here. And also go, make, go ahead and call this inside our column. So now we will also call our edit number field here. And if we refresh in preview, we should be able to see just an empty uh, text field there. I have a really bad habit of calling them an edit text from, from the view system day. So um, in Compose, they are a text field. <laughs> so now we have this empty um, text field. And so in the next step, we're going to start using state. So the first thing that we're gonna do is that we know that uh, we're calculating a tip. Uh, we already talked about what we were building out. And so we know that the value associ associated um, with this is going to be an amount. So we'll go ahead and create a val, um, a val being something that won't change in Kotlin. So we have vars and vals and vars are mutable and vals are immutable. So we'll make a val to start and call that amount input equals yeah, equals zero, where zero is actually a string. And then inside our text field, we'll update that also to amount input. And then again, build and refresh. And so here we see that that value is gonna be whatever is displayed on our screen. Um, if we want to go ahead and run this on our emulator, I think I still have mine running from an earlier code lab. If I went ahead and tried to change this right now, um, I'm typing, but you can, I guess I can do it on here. If I wanted to make this any other, anything else, um, we see that this isn't gonna change. And that is because we have hard coded um, this amount input to zero on the zero string over here in our composable. 
And we're not calling on on value change, which is what's going to be called anytime I try to change that. And so this won't actually update. And so it will always stay zero, even though it is supposed to be accepting our user's input. And so that just doesn't make our <laughs> tip calculator very easy or very usable um, because it doesn't do anything and it doesn't accept our user's input. And we want that to be flexible and let them enter one bill amount if they go to a nice steakhouse or a different one if they go and eat fast food. And so um, this is where we're going to start introducing and talking about the concepts of state and what we need to know about that, um, particularly for Jetpack Compose. So what happens when all of our composables run the first time is it sets up this um, composition that describes our UI. Um, we already said that Jetpack Compose is this declarative framework and declarative frameworks let allow you to describe your UI and then the data, how the UI should look depending on whatever kind of data that we get. And so when we get this initial composition, then all of our values are set. And so um, it, that composition can keep track of the values that we have and update those over time. Um, when we use, um, there's a comment in the chat just now that this reminds you a lot of Flutter and that is should is an awesome comparison to make actually because Flutter is also a declarative framework. And so you'll see a lot of crossovers between how our code is broken out into these composable functions in a really similar way to how Flutter is broken out into all of these functions that return widgets. And again, you update your UI in Flutter by updating the state. It has been a while since I did Flutter, but I always talk about how I wrote this silly little Flutter app just because I was interested in it as a framework um, as a native Android developer. And so I wanted to see what it was about. I wanted to try it out. And like just writing that simple Flutter application really set me up for success when Compose came out. Um, I could get started a lot quicker because I had already built a little bit of that mindset um, when writing this Flutter application. So anything you really learn for Flutter, there's a lot of that mindset and framework that you can and knowledge that you can port over to get started with Jetpack Compose. Um, so going back to state, um, so Flutter has state and we also have state and state and stateless widgets is um, we have this initial composition. And so over time, we want to update that. And the way that we update that is by declaring these special variables that hold state in our application. And that state allows um, the, uh, you, the framework to know that this is an important variable and when it changes, I need to update the UI. And when that, when it knows it needs to update the UI, that process is called recomposition. And when recomposition happens, we already said that all of these different things are just a bunch of different functions that emit UI to our screen. And so when state changes, um, recomposition happens and all that does is gonna re-invoke functions that depend on that piece of state. In Compose, the, the framework is going to schedule those, all of those recompositions for you so that you don't have to tell your Android app, it's time to update the screen. That's the really big difference here between a view-based system, if you worked with the view-based system, is you probably had a lot of functions like update, update username, you know, every when when your data comes back, you have to call and visit, change the visibility of some view, set the text in that view, and very manually call all of those different commands. Whereas in Compose, we have these state variables, and when those state variables change, recomposition will automatically happen because Compose will schedule that recomposition for you and knows the, about these special state variables, and so will re-invoke all your functions and update the UI. Um, state is a really complicated and kind of important uh, topic and, and a very important topic in Compose. And so is recomposition and kind of understanding how that works. Um, there's a lot of things to know about recomposition. For example, you can't guarantee what order your functions are going to be executed in. For example, here in this example, we have this text and then spacer and then edit number field. And all of those are different functions. And we can't guarantee what order those will be called in or even if they'll be called at different times. They can all be recomposing at the same time, so they can all be being re-invoked at the same time. 
composes also tries to be really performant for you. So um, if a function doesn't depend on state, for example, maybe spacer doesn't depend on any state at all. We can look at that. It's just it's just a little piece of height. Then that one will be skipped because it doesn't depend on state and it doesn't need to be updated. Um, so this is a topic I really recommend looking more into and looking into the articles and extra code labs and extra information that um, that uh, the composed documentation has around this. So we've talked a lot about, I've talked a lot about um, this concept of state and how um, Compose is going to know about what variables update state. Um, right now we just have this value amount input. We already saw that this doesn't trigger recomposition because when we try to change it, nothing happens. And so instead, the first thing that we're gonna do is update this to a var. Um, so again, we said that val meant it couldn't be updated. And so now we have var that can be updated. And instead of having just the set equal to um, this hard-coded string of zero, we can instead give this a type where that type is gonna be mutable state the template type of string and then set this equal to mutable state of and now give this the default of zero. Um, you can think about mutable state is an object that kind of wraps around this this value that it holds so you can kind of think about it as like a box. <laughs> I was looking at my cat earlier so I have uh, a, a cat that likes to get in this box in my living room um, but this mutable state holds this value and that value inside of it can change. Um, and that value inside of it right now is set to zero. And so we can change that um, zero to one, two, three, but the object itself, the mutable state that kind of wraps around it does not change. Right now we um, have an error in our code. So if we hover over this for a second, we can see that this says creating a state object during composition without remember. And so we'll come back to that in the next couple, next steps. The other thing that we see is we also have an error on our text field now. So if we hover over that, um, we see that none of the functions can be called with the arguments supplied. And that's because we just looked actually at both the two text field implementations. There's one that has an annotated or has this text field value and one that has a string. Um, and so right now we are now, amount input is now set to this type of mutable state, whereas before it was set to a value of string. And so we need to get that value out of that box. Um, this zero that's mutable state is like wrapped around. And so instead we can do this dot value to pull, pull that string actually out of there. And then finally, we're actually gonna go ahead and update um, our on value change. So we already talked about how this is a Lambda function, it's a callback and that gets called every time um, the input of that string changes by your user. And so that function is gonna give us back that updated string. You can see in Android Studio, you get that little like gray box, um, that little gray hint that says it um, is type string. And so that's telling us that we get this variable by default named it, and that's gonna be a type string. And that will be the, use, the new value that we get from this text field. And so if we want to, for readability's sake, we can go ahead and give that a name too. We can call that new input and then have a little arrow. So now I've given that, that input I get back from this callback, the name new input. And all I wanna do is set my amount input dot value um, equal to whatever new input I get. So if I run this now, terminate that. This is a fun error because it lets me run regardless. Um, now I can try to change this again and I'll quickly find out that I still can't. Um, so if I try to change it to, to anything else, it um, doesn't have to be limited to a number right now, uh, we see that it still doesn't change. And that's because um, when this recomposition happens, uh, edit text or edit the edit number field knows now that amount input is the special state, which means it needs to recompose because it needs to try to change. But we also said that this process of recomposition is just calling that function again. So it just re-invokes that function um, edit number field. 
And so if we just think through this, we're here, uh, we get this new input. We try to set this input to the, uh, this new input to our, um, our mutable state of um, amount input. So we try to reset that value. Uh, compose immediately says, okay, great. It's time to schedule recomposition. We've changed the state. And so if we start back at the top of this function, the first line that we're gonna hit there is where we define amount input and we set it equal to a default amount of zero. So this, this amount input gets reset every single time that we do our recomposition um, after, it gets, after it gets reset. And so we're still not able to actually change our value of input. And so what we can now do is meet this new remember function. So if we do remember, uh, remember, and wrap, wrap that around our mutable state and import, um, this is going to let us remember the value that it is across those different recompositions. And if we look in here, we do see that remember is a lowercase um, composable function. And so these do exist um, depending on the use case uh, in Compose. So when we wrap this around, all this is doing is telling Compose when you recompose, like you do not need to reset this. You need to remember the value that it had um, in between these compositions. And so it's not really using a more global value um, as much as it's just telling Compose that this is something we want to remember across this process um, of recomposition and that we don't want to reset it every single time it executes this function. The other thing that we can do, which is just some nice um, syntax to make this a little bit less confusing, is if we hover over this var right now, we notice that it's going to tell us that this variable is never modified. And so we could declare it using a val. And that can be a little confusing of a concept to people because it's something called mutable state of. But what we have to think about is that while it's mutable state, the only thing that we're actually changing is the value inside of that state object and not the, ob the state, ob not um, the mutable state itself. So we're changing value. See here, we change value. We set that equal to new input, but we never reassign amount input itself. Well, Sarah, um, uh, yeah. sorry, sorry to interrupt. There's a question. So using a more global value? Yeah, so it's not really a global value because we're still using it inside this function. It's still very specific to this function itself. Um, remember, it's just like a special com composable function. That means that we don't have to reset it over every time that uh, we call it. Also, what's an in inline function in Kotlin? So inline is another special keyword that we can use. Um, and I, I really mostly recommend going into um, some of the, the Kotlin syntax to really dive into what that is and when you might need to use it. Um, but it lets you use these template variables or these template um, types. So remember works for any kind of uh, type here. Um, so we're using it here around this mutable state of string, but it doesn't have to necessarily be that. Um, so I recommend looking into inline functions um, separate because I as a a, a function of Kotlin, and you can uh, learn a little bit more about that in some of the Kotlin cones, um, as opposed to um, this Compose Code Lab. Um, so uh, right now, this is a var. We could set it to a val. But instead, what we're going to do is take advantage of some of the things that we can do with Kotlin. And we're going to get rid of some of these different, um, some of these uh, set where we, we were, sorry. <laughs> Um, right here, we're explicitly defining the type over here, um, but instead, and setting it equal, instead we can use this Kotlin um, syntactic sugar and call it, that's by. And when we do that, we're going to get a couple of errors. So the first thing that we do have to do is import get value. Oh no! Um, and so by doing this now, instead of amount the amount input being defined as the mutable state itself. So previously when we were talking about this, we had amount input is a type of mutable state of, and that 
and its value inside was a string. When we change this out and use this by syntax, it instead pulls out the value itself. Um, and so now amount input is gonna be of type string and we don't have to do all these extra dot values everywhere. Amount input will be the, the value inside that mutable state of instead of being the mutable state itself. And so we can remove value here and it's just immediately a string and also remove um, value here. And now amount input is actually a var because it's that value inside which is changeable versus um, when we were setting it equal to the mutable state. And then it the state was not mute. The, uh, we were not reassigning the state, but we were assigning, reassigning the value inside the state. So this makes it a lot easier to read and we don't have to do all those dot values all over the place. So let's um, run the app again. So I need to terminate this. Um, for reference, I, I don't think that they removed these. Um, I was curious about that when you said that, but they are still available online, it looks like. I think they used to be available inside maybe the ID and that maybe is gone, but it's still, you can still work through it on Kotlin's website directly. And I, and by far the, that that's how I learned Kotlin when I needed to switch over from Java. So definitely a recommendation. Uh, okay, so we had this complex conversation about state and all of that was just to see if we could now update this to anything else. And so right now um, I have no requirements about what it is. And so all it is is a string. And so I'll start it with a zero. I can type in hello Android. I can type in Hello, uh, GDG San Jose. But the most important thing here is that we can make changes. So our amount input, regardless of the fact that this is not necessarily an inputted amount, um, we can now um, update that string and our, it's remembered across recomposition. We aren't stuck with that initial zero value. I lost my screen. Oh, there it is. <laughs> um, okay, so now we actually wanna go get back to our tip calculator. We figured out the state thing, or at least we made some progress toward understanding it. Um, but now we're, we're still, in our, still in this journey to writing a tip calculator. Um, something that we wanna uh, take a look at um, in this is also just looking at how that recomposition works. And so what we can do is set um, a breakpoint here on amount input. And we're going to use the debugger in, Jet in uh, Android Studio. So that will be our little debug button up here. And if we launch that, again, we'll terminate that and wait for it um, while it tells me to force close. So back in our original state, we have that zero set up. Um, I'm going to click on it um, and delete it. And so we're immediately going to see that we hit that break point where we're setting our new amount um, right here. We set, see here. Um, and so the moment that we enter that text, we see that on value change is going to be called. And we also have this amount input delegate here where right now it is zero. And if I go ahead and resume that, I put a breakpoint up here also, um, and then type a one. Ah, not there. In my in my text field, we'll see again. Amount input is being hit again because we're inside that function. And now we'll we'll see that that value is set to one now. And so we can see how many times that function was called during that, during those recompositions by setting these breakpoints and seeing every time that we're called that um, we hit those breakpoints inside of that function. All right. 
Let's modify the appearance a little bit. Let's make a pretty tip calculator. I'm going to close this back because once we get back into modifying the appearance, then we can just use our preview and don't have to necessarily rerun the app. Um, so we can take advantage of some nice features of uh, these text fields. Uh, we want to make sure, number one, it's accessible. And so something that we can add is that when we want to make sure our app is accessible is we want to make sure that there's always something displayed. Um, by default, if I don't have this zero there at all, so I set this back to an empty string and build and preview that app, it's just going to be an empty an empty box. And that's not going to tell our users what that field should they should input into that field. We could maybe assume that they can put that together, but that's not going to be a really good user experience. And so we can use the label in, in the text field. So if we look at our text field, it's easier to see. We see that label is just a composable um, is a composable function. So it is also just um, a, 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 a lambda function as well. Um, and so we can pass in any kind of content that we want. And so we have, just like we had uh, these thicker uh, curly braces for on values change because it's a lambda function, um, we also get this for our label. All we're gonna do is add a little text here. So we can add a text and use one of the strings again that we've already used. So we'll set that equal to this text and use string resource with an ID again. And so this one will be r.string dot, um, I think it is the cost of service. So now if we build and refresh that, we now see that there is something now in that, ed that text field by default. And so that tells our users what they should be putting in that text field when they click on it. Similar to when a form will like have the little grayed out, the email to let you know you should put an email in versus a phone number. It gives your users a lot of context for what should be there. And also that label is gonna be read um, by talkback uh, if there's nothing in that field so that users with some kind of um, disability will also be able to use your app a little bit easier. We can also add another modifier. Um, right now, this doesn't, This, when we look at our actual application, we see that it's kind of wonky um, as far as how this uh, text field is um, taking up the space of our screen. It looks okay in our little preview because it's just wrapped around it, but in an actual screen, there's a lot of extra space on this right side and not a lot on the, on the front. And so we can also add a modifier here and do modifier equals modifier dot fill max width. Um, when we do that inside our preview, nothing will really change. Um, it'll look about the same, got a little bit wider, I think. Um, so now we have done this. We can, making sure I hit all the things that they wanted to cover in the code lab. Um, we'll also set a single line equal to true. And so that means if you wanted to enter a very extravagant and very expensive meal, um, you can, can, but it'll just start pushing over the front digits over to um, off the screen. So you'll get stuck with that instead of um, wrapping around the text and becoming a multi-line uh, text field. It's just gonna keep everything on one line, but all of the information will be there to start scooching off the screen at the start. And then we also want to add a keyboard option. So we can do keyboard options and do keyboard options. And then here we're gonna pass in a keyboard type. So far we were talking about how this is just a string. I could type in hello Android, I could type in hello GDG San Jose and all of those worked. But when we're actually building this tip calculator, we don't want our users to be able to do that because hello Android is not, is not a valid um, number to get started with when we're calculating the total cost of our bill. So we wanna limit our users to just be able to type in numbers here. So we'll use um, keyboard type and use the number uh, here. And as we're doing this, we're again, importing different things uh, to make that work. And a lot of those imports will just happen automatically so we don't have to worry about them. So now let's go ahead and see that. So we still have our cost of service. And if we click on here, now we see we just get numbers here. So we can do 
nine, but we can no longer type in just hello, hello Android. So we've gotten ourselves to a really good place where we have this input set up really well, um, but we know we haven't actually calculated any tips yet. And so the next thing that we wanna do is add a new function. Um, and so this will just actually be a regular old Kotlin function. So we'll set it equal to private and create a function called calculate tip. And not a composable function, nothing special, just regular old syntax. Um, and so the first thing that we, we need to pass in is the amount. And so that will be a double because it's um, a decimal, not a whole number. And then also a tip percent. And that will also be a double. And in this case, um, we're going to go ahead and give a default of 15%. Inside our function, we're going to create the tip, which will be our tip percent over 100 times the amount. And then we're going to use a couple of built-in functions from, from Android. Um, specifically, we're going to use this number format. Number format. And call uh, get currency instance um, and dot format. And then we can pass in tip here. And so that just lets our app be localized to different regions um, so that uh, it's not necessarily always just the United States. And we actually want to return that. So we'll add a return type to this function. We'll do string here and then add the return keyword in front of this. And so that will return um, the tip formatted as, as, a, as a dollar, a dollar amount. So uh, we, can, we can start thinking about how we want to use this now that we have it set up is that we now have us calculate tip. And the other thing that we wanna do is be able to add a tip amount to our screen. So right here at the bottom, we're gonna add another text, text here and use the last string resource that we had. So that last string resource, we'll do r.string, string, dot, calculate tip, and when, or this is not the right one, um, tip amount is what I need, tip amount um, here, and we already talked about this when we added it, is that this is a formatted string, and so it takes another string in to replace this percentage S. And so in this string resources, I can add just um, an empty string here. And so let's go ahead and again, run the app, terminate. And so now I have my calculate tip, I have my cost of service, and I have a tip amount. And I have this function that we just put together, this calculate tip, but so far I don't have a way to connect these different things. Um, I can calculate, I can use my calculate tip. What we need passed in there is the amount. The only place that I have an amount is inside my edit, my edit number field. So I can add a new variable here. I can call it val tip. And that's going to look like calculate tip. Um, and that will, we need to pull that from our amount. And so that would be something like our amount input. And we can call a Kotlin function to double or null. And so that will try to parse a double out of the string that we're getting. We can only get strings out of this um, text field. So we need to convert that into a double so that we can use it in our calculate tip. Um, and if it doesn't work, so if it were to try to parse hello Android, it's going to return null instead because it doesn't know how to convert that into a double. And so I can give it a default value. Um, so I can give it a... a value um, when it is null. So if I get a null from this amount input dot two double or null, and we know when it would return null is if it doesn't know how to convert that string into a double, then we can use this Elvis operator, which will um, happen if this first part is null to give it a value to return instead. So basically all of this, this whole line is gonna say, 
if amount um, input dot to double or null is not null, return that double. Otherwise, you can return 0.0. .0. So if it's null, it will return 0.0. .0. Otherwise, it's going to return the double amount that's parsed from that amount input. But again, I don't have anything to do with this tip amount. Um, up here, I have this text field inside my column, which is where I need to add my tip amount so that it can be visible. The only place that I have amount is down here in this edit number field. And that's the only place I can use, I can get my amount and use this calculate tip function to calculate the value that I need. And so this poses a problem for us here um, because I have tip inside one function and I need to get it into a different place in my application. And so there's a really great um, visual image. And so I actually am going to pull this over where we can kind of visualize where state lives versus where state needs to live. This is how we have this um, set up right now, right? We have our tip time screen and inside of that we have that header and then we have this edit number field and then we have this text. And inside that edit number field composable, we have this amount input state. Really, we need to be able to share that state across these two different composable functions. Both the edit number field needs to have access to that to know what to display um, in the edit text and also to be able to update it. And we also need to be able to just have it in, available to our um, text, our tip amount, text, <laughs> text to display the tip amount. And so we need to be able to pull that amount input state up into this tip time screen um, composable so that both have access to it. And that process is going to be the process called a state hoisting. And state hoisting is when you take your state to the highest parent composable um, that is sh sh um, the highest parent composable that is necessary for all of the children, child composables to have access to that state. And this allows us to avoid race conditions and be able to share that across different composables. So they're all updated at the same time and always have the same value. So right now, all of those are defined inside this edit number field. And so we need to hoist that state up and put it inside our tip time screen and pass it down to both this edit number field and also down to our text composable. So we can pull this out. So let's go ahead and copy and delete this. So we have lots of red now. And so we can add this in up here. I'm gonna try and make sure I mess match this. Great. So I can add it into my tip time screen. So let's add it up here. Awesome. And then I need to update my edit number field um, function so that I have access to those and I have these passed in. Uh, there's a question here, Sierra. Um, are state changes preserved after configuration changes like screen rotations? So um, remember actually does not remember across a configuration change like a screen rotation, um, but there is an additional remember function called remember remember savable and uh, not the one with inputs. And so remember savable will be would um, be preserved across a configuration change. Um, in our case, uh, we're not going to worry about that. So we'll keep using remember. But there are these two different versions of remember and one is going to help with um, configuration changes. So if you need that data to be preserved when you rotate the screen, then you'd want to switch out and use Remember Savable instead. So let's jump back in and quickly and start thinking about how we can update this. Um, so the first thing that we want to do is we know that we need um, a value to be passed in. And that is going to be a string. And so now instead of having a mount here, we can now have value here. And that will just now be the value that we show. And then we also have this problem with our on value change. So to account for that, just like we get a callback here uh, in this text field, we're also going to pass in a callback. So we'll just actually call it the same thing and call it on value changed. And that will be the same type. So it will be a string um, 
it will take in a string and it will be a functional type that returns a unit. And so now again, instead of doing this, I'm going to copy it so I have it ready. This will be on value change. So really now our edit number field has the same required arguments that we had to fill in for text field. So we're just pushing that up a level as well. And so inside edit number field, we now have our um, little red line here because we're missing our two arguments. So for value, we can set this equal to the amount input. And our on value changed, we can just paste in the exact same function. So now we're going to pass in this amount input that is our state that we've now defined inside the tip, tip time screen. And we're going to pass in the same on value changed. But now we also are able to pass in um, the tip here so that it has access to that as well. And then we can make a couple of changes just to make our um, tip look a little bit nicer as well. So here we'll go ahead and add a modifier. In do modifier dot align. We'll align that. Align mint dot center horizontally. So the same thing as before. We'll add a font. I uh, forgot a comma. Do a font size of 20.sp and a font weight of font weight bold. So let's go ahead and run this again. And so if I have um, a $40 bill, we see that immediately that tip is updated and our tip amount for a $40 bill at 15% tip is gonna be $6. And so now when um, our amount input is changed through this callback, it's gonna recomp, it was gonna run recomposition on both the edit number field to update the number that is showing inside that um, text field, and then also run recomposition on this text that now, this text composable that now also depends on the amount through the tip, um, um, through the tip. And so both are updated as well. And so that actually gets us to the end of our code lab on state. And so um, in conclusion, <laughs> so let's go over some of the different things that we learned here. So we built a little bit of a UI. So if you missed last time, we learned a little bit about com the column and these different texts and these different composables that are available to us. Um, we built out a new co uh, composable function to be a little chunk of our screen. We learned about state. We learned about mutable state of and um, how, to, how that's important with recomposition. We talked a little bit about recomposition itself and what we need to think about and why remember is so important for that instance. We also um, managed to talk about remember savable as well um, because we could rotate this and see that it would get reset and test, test it with um, remember savable. And so we can really put all of this together. And so what I recommend um, as the best next step here is that the next um, code lab here in this series is gonna take this app that we just built and um, add in um, letting you set the, uh, um, the tip percentage as well. And so you'll again, you'll add a second um, text field, which we already learned how to build. So you'll be able to build and test that knowledge on your own. And then combine that with updating, adding new state to keep track of both um, the, the cost of the service and the tip amount to update two different text fields as well. There is a question here. This is so nice. Also, like, can composables be like partially updated? So it will, um, Recomposition will try to be as smart as it can and only update composables that it needs to update. So it will reinvoke the parts of the composable functions that, um, that depend on that state and only update as little as it can. But again, all of that is really outside of your control. The biggest thing for you as a developer is thinking about um, how often you're updating your state variables and seeing how often that triggers. And in the newer version of Android Studio, you can kind of do some of that debugging yourself. Um, they have 
uh, recomposition counters built in because that is like one of the big performance hits of Compose is seeing how many times you update something. Um, and there was a really good talk and example from um, the Android Dev Summit a couple of weeks ago where they showed how setting up your state a little bit differently can greatly reduce the number of recompositions you have. And so that's really what you want to think about as a developer is not necessarily how the re what's going to happen when recomposition gets called because that's internal, right? Compose itself reschedules schedules those recompositions. All you need to think about is how you're setting up your state and updating your state to like be the most efficient. Cool. Nice. Um, okay. Thank you. I think if, if there are any more questions, please post it. And Sierra, do you want to uh, post your social handles if you can? Sure, and sure. I'm going to take the screen for now. Yeah, yeah. I think I need to stop. Right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, while Sierra is going to add.